Welcome to TAC Team Tune-Up, where we take a look at training and curriculum development for law enforcement. Now, in this episode, I just wanted to talk about what we do within the academy from a physical preparation standpoint, but primarily from an assessment piece. Now, another episode talks about you know why we do physical ability testing within the police academy. I just want to talk about what that kind of looks like for us. So think of this as kind of not necessarily a case study or case review, but just what we're currently doing and why. So first off, I'm a huge fan of physical ability testing. I believe all police academies should implement them, um, but definitely from a periodic piece. So from efficacy of program, does our program work? Most academies, and I say that loosely because I don't know the statistics, I haven't looked at all the academies, so I can't say most, but many academies perform physical fitness training. They implement PT, whether it's in the morning, in the evening, at some point, right? There's some sort of, uh, sort of physical training. Now, how do we know that works, right? Efficacy of program. Does our program work? How do we know if it does or not? And so you need to be implementing some sort of gauge of where you're at. Are cadets improving? Where are they improving? How are they improving? Or are they regressing? And where and why? So utilizing physical ability from a sense of gauging efficacy. Now, the start, when I started working with programs, the first thought process was, let's implement periodic testing to assess intervention. And intervention doesn't have to be training. It can also be curriculum. So the primary academy that I work with and I actually teach the fitness, wellness, uh, nutrition, stress management section, chapter three. Um, we implemented four bouts of physical ability testing throughout the duration of the academy class, um, which spans, you know, um, day class about six months, night class about nine months. Now we did about four different, um, uh, four different days spread out throughout that duration in which we had the cadets perform testing. Now, what does that look like and why? So first of why, we wanted to know in the first block, especially because there were no one was doing physical fitness training. There was not a strength and conditioning uh, coach. There was not a trainer in, in place. There was not built-in scheduled time for PT. So PT did not exist. So before we made a change, we had to figure out what was going on um, and, and what was happening, right? Tier one is observation. So the first block, so let's say you do four bouts of testing, Within an academy class, we did that for about two or three different classes just to gauge where everyone was at. The first block, you know, once we did pre-testing, we tested at the very beginning of the academy. And then that duration until that second test, or let's say the first mid-test, there really wasn't, cadets just knew they did a pat. We told them what their results were and we told them, you know, kind of the attributes they worked and had them self-reflect, but then said, hey, you're going to have to test again, do something about it right? Well, many of them did not. Some of them were like, okay, I need to get in shape. Now, how they trained was based on what they thought fitness was and how to train and so forth. Now, we didn't just completely step away. What I did was just say openly say, hey, if you have questions, concerns, or if you want to meet with me in my office, you want to have a discussion, you know, I am a qualified professional that can have this conversation with you and, and be able to guide you, but you have to take that initiative. It was all put on them to have that accountability and responsibility. Uh, there were a couple of cadets that met with me, asked questions and started implementing training, but uh, it was far and few. So that was the first block. And then the second block, right, after they did that first mid-test, then we provided, that's when I came in to teach. So we did chapter three, we did fitness, wellness, had some nutrition, some stress management, but the intervention was curriculum. It was not training. So it was Ken just doing a 16 hour block of education in one large, like it was just two day, 16 hour block. Does that provide enough value for cadets to make a difference and to train on that by themselves? Right. And then, and then they did their second mid test. And then we met, did, we analyzed the pat. I'm trying to reflect for a second. We analyzed the pat. We talked about how you train. Um, we discussed a little bit of programming. 
And then again, it was up to them to facilitate their own training. And then we did post testing. Now we have data from the past, you know, four different classes. We haven't broke down all of the data, but being the one who does the reports for e each individual cadet, um, not many people progress, not many classes average wise, right? The accumulated or aggregated summary of the report, classes did not progress. So we had to establish, and many of us that are fitness instructors, many of the us that are in academia and in strength and conditioning and so forth, we know this. You can't just provide 16 hours of, hey, this is what fitness and wellness is, and just expect, expect people to get it and make time for it and to train for it. It doesn't work that way. So this next step is providing a full strength and conditioning program uh, where I'll be coordinating, I'll be instructing, but then I'll also have an assistant with me that's interning, that's helping me throughout that process. That's where we're currently at moving forward. We have a day class um, that's starting in a couple of months that we're preparing for, uh, that I'm heavily preparing for, that I want to make as, you know, as efficient as possible. Um, but it will also be a trial and error uh, in the sense of, you know, I, I, I'm pretty biased, right? But um, super familiar with programming and approach training. And I go through this three phase process where we work on movement quality first, then we add some additional load, then we add complexity and skill. So there is a, a sequence to um, the development process. There is a method to the madness, but it'll be trial and error in building this program up. Um, we do have the, and I say loosely the luxury, but we have the access to, because it is a research collaboration. We do have access to facility. We have access to strength equipment, and we do have the opportunity to make something amazing out of this. Um, I do love the fact that we're uh, meshing university research with this um, so we can truly analyze everything. Um but we're also integrating our education strength and conditioning program where those students that are going into their internship can actually intern and help facilitate the program. Um, so, so just overall, a great development process to it. Um, I'm very excited to be able to implement this program and really get it um, started, to really get it started and to really drive it moving forward. Again, my mentality is how to, let's take, a breath and take a step back and go, the thought process to training is figuring out how do I meet you where you're at? But then we approach it from crawl, walk, jog, run. How do we build you up from where you're at? And let's say an accumulation of everybody. So how do we figure out where the group is at, figure out where your deficiencies are, and how do we empower you to progress and to move forward? So the thought process is in the very beginning, of course, physical ability testing is necessity. So we have a job simulation based testing that we'll do in the very beginning. Um, and that physical ability test is going to include or that job simulation based testing is going to include a series of tasks. Um, I, I can't remember the exact number of tasks as I'm talking about it. Maybe you count and you go, oh, OK, it's A, it's nine, it's whatever. But it's a series of tasks that should reflect job tasks that you'll perform in the field. So first one is doing a kneeling to standing um, task. Can't use your hands, right? You have to start on both knees and then you go to a standing position. You're able to move forward, right? Can you actually get up uh, without utilizing your hands or arms for support? Which is critical. Anytime you are in a critical situation, um, you're dealing with an offender, um, you're dealing with having to manipulate move objects, you can't always brace your legs or your knees with your hands and push up or push off the ground to be able to stand up. You have to be able to stand up without that support. So that's first and foremost. Um, then you'll go through a series of jumping over and under hurdles. Um, so change of elevation. Can you go from a sprint to be able to go under an object and then get back up and continue to perform the task, right? So change of elevation, being able to jump over a curb, go under an object, go under a fence, go under something, right? Go under a table, whatever it might be. Uh, next, we have um, a push. So there is a weighted push. It's rather light. Uh, we're just looking for power. Once they engage with the object, they're performing that task as powerful as possible. We want to see how much power you can generate from your lower body. 
Um, then there is a serpentine, so serpentine around cones. You should be able to maneuver around, whether it's posts, whether it's cars in a parking lot, whatever it might be, you should be able to change direction and change direction rapidly as well as fluently. Um, then we have a recall. So in the very beginning, uh, I give them a series of letters and numbers to re represent a license plate. And then once they get halfway, previously they've had to mark, right? We've had a um, prior, we've had a board that has had four options. This class currently had eight options. So there was a board that had just the letters and a board that had just the numbers. So they had to choose one from each. Um, but ultimately progressing forward this next class, it will be a blank piece of paper and they're gonna have to write down the license plate. I want you to know that when your heart rate is high, when you're stressed, when your anxiety is high, right? You can still remember what that bit of information was and you can recall it and you can relay it onto a piece of paper. Next, you're going through and performing a victim drag. Um, they're performing the task backwards. They have to make sure they can secure the object, whether it's wrapped around the torso or utilizing the two straps on the vest. Um, but you have to do a victim drag going backwards. Next, doing a sequence of crawls. So I need to know not only can you crawl forwards, especially when you're under stress, your heart rate's high, you know, you're a little bit fatigued, maybe you're breathing hard, but you need to change elevation. And not only should you crawl forwards, but I want to know you can crawl backwards. I want to know you're able to escape a situation or press off when, uh, when you're tired, when you're fatigued. Going backwards has always been difficult for cadets. And so we establish the framework for not just upper body, you know, overhead strength, but being able to utilize uh, muscular endurance, especially with overhead movements. When you're crawling backwards, yes, there's a lot of pressing, but it's pressing backwards. So it's a lot of overhead. Um, and we're seeing not as much cadets having that sort of muscular endurance um, and just overall shoulder stability and shoulder strength to be able to press themselves backwards. Uh, but then last but not least, finishing through with a sprint. Once you're tired, when everything is said and done, do you have enough in the tank to sprint? And it's not a far sprint, but I need to know you can stand up and you can press yourself forwards and be able to complete the task or complete the mission. So overall, it doesn't take that much time, you know, typically less than two minutes, uh, depending on the cadet, but the framework is the same. Where are you at? What's your baseline? How do we empower you moving forward? Are you aware of your fitness level? If you say you're strong, if you say you're fast, if you say you're in shape, what does that really mean? And what does that really look like? So I know I've kind of gone off into so many different loops with this. Um, I love speaking about what we're doing, specifically in this primary program that I'm working with. Um, but overall, that's what our physical ability looks like from a job simulation standpoint. But then from a fitness assessment piece, there's so many options. Um, I've recently integrated more visuomotor testing. So looking at, and you can look up DynaVision D2. So utilizing a visuomotor board to where we're looking at reaction time. We're looking at peripheral function and FOV, being able to identify um, targets, being able to identify threats, being able to create a pattern in your head and initiating and executing a reaction uh, or an action in general, but it's a reaction to the light, um, as well as cognitive load. How are you performing when you there's a sense of cognitive stress, meaning you're overstimulated? And can we assess that? Can we find that? Um, so utilizing some sort of visuomotor testing, that's relatively new in the sense of primarily uh, profiling cadets, you know, where are you at? We're not doing really before afters. We haven't really gone down the rabbit hole of thresholds and so forth. Um, but I would like to look at it and kind of side by side, look at marksmanship and see if there's some sort of correlation. Are there some sort of indicators? And can we move forward with that thought process? So that's another avenue um, we implement DARI motion from a movement assessment piece. That's the luxury of working alongside a research um, exercise physiology lab uh, that has a tactical research team uh, where I serve as the uh, tactical strength and conditioning SME. Um, so having that relationship, having that collaboration, we're able to use some high-tech equipment like the Visiomotor uh, testing board, the DynaVision D2 testing board. Uh, the Dari motion, uh, markerless motion capture system, being able to analyze movement, 
Um, we also look at uh, this coming class, I'm going to be integrating force plates uh, where I'm looking at repetitive movement. So not only are you powerful, like vertical jump or plyometric pushups and things like that, but how how, mu how many times can you be powerful? Because it's not what you can do once, it's what you can do once, recover from, and do again. So can you replicate that power? What is that state of regression? And how does that power start to disseminate and to decrease? How does fatigue build up the more repetitions you do? So just thought process behind implementing force plates. Um, I do want to do some more field testing for mov movement analysis, maybe some FMS, maybe some just different mobility tasks that we're looking at range of motion. Haven't really figured that out yet, but that's just the thought process initially going into this upcoming police academy class. So again, you can think of this as kind of a, an overview of what we're doing, uh, but then also a thought process in academy classes moving forward. And as we enter into and we start this upcoming academy class, I would love to do another one of this and, and make it an ongoing series where we're talking about the program moving forward. What does program development look like? And to share lessons learned, to share best practices, what is working, what is not why are we making these adjustments and so forth? So if you work within a police academy class, maybe you're an instructor at an academy, maybe um, you're an agency that has an internal academy, feel free to reach out. I love working with, collaborating with, and having discussions of what are you doing? Why are you doing it? How can we help? That's that's the ultimate phrase here at Jabai Performance is how can we help? Um, and, and just love having sit down discussions. Um, so never hesitate if you have questions or concerns, feel to free, uh, feel free to reach out um, and, and just continue to drive the aspect of cadet preparation. How can we not just, don't just try and break the cadets. Don't try and just ingrain work hard, like work hard should already exist. How do we truly build a frame for a uh, framework of where you're at and build upon that. Use assessments as a piece or a gauge, a, a measurement, a metric of where you're at, and then implement testing periodically to figure out the efficiency, the efficacy of your program. 